Across the collegiate landscape, there are some colleges that are held in a sort of mystical prestige when it comes to academics. Stanford, Rice, and Duke come to mind up front, but the predominant members of this fraternity are undeniably the members of the Ivy League. Brown, Columbia, Cornell, Dartmouth, Harvard, Princeton, Penn, and Yale. These universities are held together primarily by their academic excellence, or perception of academic excellence, but their grouping as a collective is solidified by their tendency to compete together in collegiate athletics. The Ivy League, once the most prominent group of college athletics teams in the Northeast and the rest of the country, has stood the test of time as one of the longest living college sports conferences, even after ridding themselves of scholarships to exemplify the penultimate student athlete. Of course, these schools aren't the only universities that are good at academics and have Division I sports programs as well. There once was a time where the college sports world attempted to build a second Ivy League to combat the perceived academic dominance of the first one, this time in the American South. It's time to ask the question, what if the Magnolia Conference had been formed? In order to understand the purpose of a Magnolia Conference, we have to look at the college world in the 1940s and 1950s. Specifically, we have to look at one group in particular, the 1948 Vanderbilt Commodores. You see, Vanderbilt had previously been a charter member of the SIAA in the late 1800s and later joined the Southern Conference in 1922. These large groupings of colleges below the Mason-Dixon line were made specifically for college sports games and weren't too discriminatory in terms of college size or sports proficiencies. Vanderbilt played alongside athletic powers like Alabama and Maryland, but also academic ones like Duke and Tulane. When a handful of members split to create the SEC in 1933, Vanderbilt's standing as both an incredibly solid research university as well as a good athletic force made them an easy decision to join a conference situated largely west of the Appalachian Mountains. But in the early all-white iteration of the SEC, Vanderbilt stood head and shoulders above the rest of the conference academically. This was fine, but their lack of real peers in the conference made them a bit of a sideshow as early as their first athletic season in 1933. They were the smart college in the conference, which, for the South, was already an outlier in public perception. The Commodores were already dealing with the perception that the only place in the entire country that could do elite academics were the more northern-oriented colleges. The Ivy League was almost entirely situated in the Northeast, and other colleges up to the Ivy's level academically, like Stanford or UChicago, were in otherwise metropolitan places. Vanderbilt, and by extension other research-based southern universities, couldn't escape the stereotype that surrounded Southern colleges. Good at sports, and good enough to get you a degree, but not much else when compared to the Metro Elite. While there was no way to circumvent the stereotype on the outset, Vanderbilt Chancellor Harvey Branscombe did see a different way to improve the perception of Vanderbilt, especially up north. Form relationships with the Ivy League. And one way to do that was to play them consistently. After discussing scheduling, Branscombe was able to secure a game with the Yale Bulldogs in 1948. He even went so far as to have the Commodores travel to Connecticut to take on the Bulldogs in their own home stadium, the Yale Bowl, to potentially further improve the relations between the two schools. There was only one problem. The 1948 Vanderbilt Commodores turned out to be really good. Going into the Yale game, the Commodores were 1-2-1, one, and one, so it was tough to determine just how good they really were. Turns out Red Sanders' last Commodore team was pretty dang good. They smacked the Bulldogs 35 to nothing in front of 30,000 Bulldog faithful and proceeded to only allow four more touchdowns for the rest of the season on their way to finishing 8-2-1 and, and earning a ranking as the 12th best team in the country. After getting shellicked, Yale declined to have any further relations with Vanderbilt on the field of play, making it incredibly difficult for any future athletic events to be scheduled, and potentially for any academic alliances to be formed as well. With the door to nationwide relevance rapidly closing, Branscombe panicked. There was one more option, however. If he couldn't join the current Ivy League, he'd just make a new one. This time, in the South. While Vanderbilt was still a member of the SEC, Branscombe called a meeting with chancellors from a handful of other academically inclined Southern private schools. Among them were Southern Methodist, the Rice Institute, Duke, and Tulane, as well as the small Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. Despite holding this meeting, nothing came to fruition. But it was considered a legitimate option. Vanderbilt continued its membership in the SEC, but since that door was never closed, when other players grew restless, it was once again revisited. This time the conversation was started by officials at Tulane. By 1963, Tulane was starting to come to terms with the reality that they were no longer built for the direction the rest of the SEC was going. 
Tulane's higher academic floors compared to the rest of the conference had led to them essentially handicapping themselves when it came to recruiting talent, which in turn led to them stagnating while the rest of the league improved. While not the sole reason for their inevitable departure, this sense that their academics was causing them to no longer be a fit for the SEC was the initial push they needed to look elsewhere. And that elsewhere was a revisitation of the Magnolia League. It was the perfect idea. They would go to a league that valued academics as much as the Northern League did, possibly even entertaining the idea of a non-scholarship player, and would finally be able to counteract that Northern stereotype. They'd be able to play high-end Division I sports, namely football, while still keeping the elite academics. And it wouldn't be just Tulane. Of course, they contacted the same universities from before to create the league, but once again it was shot down, this time for money. Duke did not want to give up its annual rivalry game with North Carolina, as joining a separate conference would make scheduling that game more difficult as a non-conference game. In Texas, SMU and Rice were benefiting greatly from the Southwest Conference's tie-ins to the Cotton Bowl, which brought money to every member of the conference and did not want to leave that money behind. But what if, in 1963, Tulane's exit from the SEC was enough to help pry these other Southern Ivies from their conferences to create an entirely new one? Obviously, since this didn't happen for good reason, we have to suspend our disbelief quite a bit. Like, there's no reason for Duke or Vanderbilt to jettison themselves from good conferences in 1963 just because they value academics. By this point, just about every conference valued academics somewhat, so that's not enough of an excuse for this. On top of that, it's impossible to guess what would happen for certain since there's a thing called the butterfly effect, but we can guess the lineup of schools and how the college sports world might have changed in minor ways around it. Here's a list of original schools considered Southern Ivies we can look at, according to bestcolleges.com. Of these colleges, we can see the six original schools mentioned up front. While we can safely assume some of these schools, like UT Austin and Virginia, wouldn't have any interest leaving their big-time money-making conferences for an academic one, there are two interesting options here to look at if the Magnolia League wanted to start out with more than just six schools. Davidson and William & Mary. Let's take a look at the Wildcats. By 1963, Davidson had spent the last handful of years struggling football-wise in the Southern Conference. This trend continued long after 1963, with their greatest season afterward coming in 1969, where the Wildcats only managed to go 7-4. and four. Scholarships were taken largely out of the equation in 1971. After this, the program fell off a cliff, with the Wildcats getting so bad by 1988 that the university had to make the decision to drop to non-scholarship Division III. They eventually settled on Division I AA as a non-scholarship independent, but by then the damage had already been done. There are two ways to look at Davidson in 1963. One, as an academic school, which they certainly would have scratched the itch of. Joining Duke and the Carolinas, Davidson would be an excellent geographical addition as well, being able to further accentuate the South and fill in the conference as another top academic university. The other is athletically. While they were better athletically than Emory, even in the 50s and 60s, there were a few statements made about the Magnolia still chasing high-profile athletics as well, and while that's most certainly just window dressing even in the 60s, it does mean something to have said. Long before Steph Curry graced the hardwood for the Wildcats, there wasn't really much to vouch for them for. Their football program had never won more than seven games a season up to that point, and their basketball program would really not begin their ascent to the level they're at today until 1964, which would be one season into their admission into the Magnolia League. While they hadn't gone that direction yet in 1963, it's clear and apparent that removing scholarship players had been discussed internally. If the Magnolia League had made a decision like the Ivy League did themselves in 1945 to remove scholarships from athletic competition, it's possible that teams like Emory or Davidson are easier to admit into the conference. But even without that, they could both have been added if conference members cared much more for academics than athletics. For the sake of simplicity though, I'm going to assume scholarships were still allowed in this Magnolia League, and I will remove both of those teams as options due to the hurdles in front of them as they were in 1963. That leaves a hole in Atlanta to fill. Luckily, Georgia Tech is right there and available. I've gone through GT's issues with recruiting and football before, but one thing I haven't really mentioned is the Yellow Jackets' high academic standing in the South in the early 60s being placed on top of a very good football program. Throughout the 50s and 60s, Bobby Dodd's Yellow Jackets were a very good football program, even having won a national championship as members of the SEC. But they did end up leaving the SEC in 1963 over disagreements with signing players. If the Magnolia was formed in 1963, it's easy to see Georgia Tech being interested in this new Southern academics-based league. They'd still lose out on classic rivalries like those against Alabama or Tennessee, 
Being able to play Georgia still every year while also being in association with highly academic universities may have actually elevated Georgia Tech to new levels. Being the big dog in a conference like this and winning more games, as Georgia Tech was still a very good team during their run as an independent in real life, as opposed to scrapping together schedules year by year, would have been great. Add that on top of yearly association with research universities like Vanderbilt and Tulane from the SEC and Duke from the ACC, and the Magnolia would have been incredibly beneficial to the university itself, not just the athletics programs. So we're back up to six. By this point in 1963, though, many conferences had already expanded to eight or so teams. One of those other mentioned schools was William & Mary in Virginia. Aside from expanding the conference footprint to another heavily populated southern state, William & Mary was also a very well-respected academic force in the state of Virginia, with a lot of ties to many of the universities in state. Despite being one of the worst football programs in the SOCON for a handful of years, the team was on the up-and-up, as can be seen following head coach Milt Drewer's firing in 1963. They were a very proud athletic brand, if not a very good one. Unfortunately for the tribe, this also carried over into basketball. They had not been very good for a while. To prove this point, William & Mary is one of just a few men's basketball programs that has never been to the big dance. Maybe joining the Magnolia League and facing higher talent would have changed that in a rising tide raises all ships sort of way, or maybe not. But their academics and location alone would have made them prominent additions to the league. While I was doing research on this conference, I came across a handful of speculative alternate history blogs that were written surrounding the Magnolia League. One blog, written by Andrew Terwerdy in 2021, has another interesting addition. Wake Forest is yet another power conference school with a heavy focus on academics that just so happened to be located in the South. There's a big chance that Wake Forest would have been interested in joining the Magnolia League, just like Georgia Tech likely would have coming out of the SEC. And maybe they would have, given some time spent in the ACC with North Carolina, NC State, South Carolina before their departure. But that's all speculative still. For the sake of the video's simplicity, I'm going to say they wouldn't have joined in 1963. But Trawardy mentions another school in his list that, as a private Division 1A independent, would have made perfect sense to add. Forget everything you know about the Miami Hurricanes in real life. Forget the bad boys, the sunglasses, the national championships in the 90s. Forget the money in the background and Jimmy Johnson. What you need to remember is that Miami was, in 1963, a private research school in a southern state. By joining the Magnolia League in 1963 and leaving independence, the U forever changes their future. In this alternate universe, Miami picks academics over glitz and glamour. They weren't anywhere near a football power in 1963, despite a couple good seasons under head coach Andy Gustafson. It's likely they stay competitive, but not a national power as early as they become in our timeline. But their status as the lone Magnolia League team in the state of Florida could provide them easier access to recruits than what they'd faced in real life as an independent. They are the eighth and final member of the initial Magnolia Conference to start play in 1963. Let's start our hypothetical alternate history's march towards the present day by examining this alternate Magnolia League. On the outset, this conference doesn't really seem like that much of a killer. And really, it isn't. The only primary football power for the first handful of years would be Georgia Tech. And aside from the growing Duke men's basketball dynasty, each of these programs didn't have standout basketball or baseball teams in the 60s. William & Mary, far away from the rest of the conference and by far the least prepared for Division I athletics, would likely have suffered as the punching bag of the conference in most sports, even below Rice. The presence of teams like Duke, Vanderbilt, SMU, and GT may have even given the conference a distinct bowl tie-in despite this, though, perhaps to a bowl like the Peach or Citrus Bowl. Lots of things are hard to predict about this conference. Like, how would this conference of, well, let's be honest, rich white elites handle integration in the 1960s? Would they integrate earlier, later, or at the same time as some of their peers? What is hard to predict more than anything is the effect being out of their real-life conferences would have had on teams like Duke or Vanderbilt. While it's easy to see a program like Vanderbilt prevent itself from falling into football obscurity in a conference with programs that could be considered their equals, Duke's ascent as a basketball power was largely due to being in a conference with NC State and North Carolina. Without the push to exceed those schools in conference, it's entirely possible that Duke's basketball programs regress to a mean instead of becoming a blue blood they're known for today. Or, alternatively, just association with those schools regionally could be enough to propel them forward. 
Other conferences would have been affected by this change, though, namely the ACC and Southwest. Without Duke and the ACC, the conference may have been more apt to keep South Carolina as a member, would likely have been more tentative about applying SAT score minimums in order to appease Gamecock officials and keep them from leaving. The hole created by the Blue Devils leaving would also provide an avenue for West Virginia to join the conference, as the school was reportedly on the short list of original ACC members, but barely missed the cut. Tarwerty does bring up a good point in his blog, however. The ACC's decision to add Florida State in the 90s heavily builds off the fact that they had already added Georgia Tech. For the sake of the video, I'm going to assume the Magnolia League survives with at least its initial members to the present day, even though this is unlikely due to the changes in the college sports world valuing brands and television markets as early as 1984 with Oklahoma v. NCAA. Despite Torwerdy's claim here, I'm going to assume the ACC does go ahead and invite FSU to join the conference anyway, perhaps even earlier, as they were a clear addition that made sense to join the ACC. Perhaps Virginia Tech or another Big East school joins earlier as well, or maybe questions about Penn State are easier for ACC officials to answer. The Southwest is more difficult, as SMU and Rice leaving creates a two-team hole in a conference that would see immense issues with teams leaving later on. We know the University of Texas was speaking to the Pac-8 and SEC about joining their conferences as early as the mid to late 1980s, if we're to believe Sports Illustrated on their roundtable of Big 12 history. It's possible that losing Vanderbilt as well as Georgia Tech and Tulane in one foul swoop would be enough to convince Texas and Texas A&M to ditch the now lame duck Southwest and move to the SEC as early as the 1960s, as those two schools were still considered locked at the hip as late as the 2000s. This could have created a massive shockwave and chain reaction that would have changed college sports nearly entirely from what we know it as today. While Houston joined the Southwest in 1972, it's possible the Southwest fixed their Rice and SMU problem by adding them as well as a school like Louisiana Tech, Tulsa, or New Mexico. It's also possible this nuclear bomb is dropped on the college sports world and just completely annihilates it. Maybe it forces teams to move past 8 or 10 in conference membership earlier than in our timeline. I don't know. Speaking of SMU, a redirected focus on academics as well as athletics could mean that the university no longer places such a heavy focus on competing in the back alley schemes that other Southwest teams utilized. It's entirely likely that SMU never cheats as often as they do in real life had they joined the Magnolia League, meaning the death penalty may never have occurred. Again, it's impossible to predict what could have happened due to the butterfly effect, but it's an interesting thought. I do think that over time, Georgia Tech's football program would stagnate, Miami's would eventually grow to be the power in conference. They could even potentially reach the levels they did as members of the Big East. If the university felt less of a need to keep up with the academics of the rest of the conference due to just being associated with them already, and decided to put money into athletics. As other conferences stretch into 10 or 12 teams going into the 90s, it'd be interesting to see what the Magnolia League decides to do. As a major conference, or at least as a conference worth mentioning, Eight schools might not be enough to keep up. With money being the way it is, it's likely that Wake Forest, if they didn't leave to join the Magnolia already by the time the 90s rolled around, elects to stay a member of the ACC due to media rights, so they either are or are not an option. The list of Southern-based, academically inclined private or research universities in the 1990s isn't very extensive. Tulsa, while a member of the FCS Missouri Valley Football Conference until 1995, could have made a solid option to join despite their small size affecting their academics if the conference wanted to strengthen their western branch and another smaller eastern team like Richmond or perhaps even the growing public research universities like North Texas or USF would have made sense as well. But it's also entirely possible the Magnolia League chooses to just stick at eight programs depending on where their aims for the future lie. What do you think would have happened if the Magnolia Conference had been formed in 1963? Would they have gotten out from the shadow of the Ivy League at all? Would some of their members have suffered athletically from having joined this conference and losing their traditional regional rivalries? Would it have even survived the rounds of conference realignment that occurred after it? What about its effects on other conferences? The cool and fun thing about hypotheticals is that, technically, everything is on the table here, since we don't really know what would have happened had this conference been formed. Sure, there are some things that might have been more likely to have happened than others, but with the timeline that separates in the 60s and runs to the present, that's a lot of time for separations to have occurred. I'm interested in seeing what you guys think about this, so let me know in a comment below.